We have the large launch cost of SLS, the latest out of Starbase, and the up-to-date information on how the invasion of Ukraine is impacting spaceflight. This is Tomorrow's Space News. Heading to the orbital launch pad, Booster 4 has been performing another cryogenic proof test. Here you can see the super heavy booster getting frostier than ever, with about 85% of the booster being covered in ice due to the very cold nature of the liquid nitrogen that is used during these tests. In order for this much of the booster to be covered in ice, all of the liquid oxygen tank and some of the methane tank would have had to be filled with LN2. The team down at Starbase have been continuing to work on the orbital tank farm over the past week, particularly focusing on the plumbing after five more tanks were delivered last week. Super Heavy Booster 7's grid fins have been spotted at the production site and unlike the grid fins we've seen on Booster 4 and 5, these are painted white, not black. Those grid fins are going to eventually be attached to this, well, not this part exactly, but the top part of what this will become. This is the aft section of Booster 7, which has seen design tweaks and upgrades as it doesn't look like the previous aft sections we have seen for Super Heavy. What is easy to see with the naked eye are the differences to the quick disconnect plate and the addition of a header tank at the top of the section. Here you can see the LOX tank section of Booster 7 which has been lifted up in the high bay as the final stacking of all the components is beginning to start. A booster stand has also been moved to the high bay on an SPMT or self-propelled modular transporter which Booster 7 will be placed onto when it is fully assembled. Another Booster 8 part has also turned up which is forward tank 2 and we got our first peek at actual ship development with this weird truss structure thing which is believed to be a payload dispenser mock-up. How this can be discerned as a payload dispenser I do not know but I'm going to trust the people who are counting the bolts 24-7. A lot of work has been focused on Super Heavy this week and not a lot on the actual Starship ship itself, but that is probably explained by the fact that SpaceX have so many different ships now and they just don't have anything for them to do. Ship 20 has been cryo-testing since the Starship update, but there's only so much data you can gather from doing the same test over and over again. We're moving to their crewed flight program now, and specifically Crew 4, as some changes have been made to the on-orbit part of that mission. Last year, it was announced that Samantha Cristoforetti of Italy, Crew 4 Mission Specialist, would serve as the commander of the ISS for the first part of Expedition 68, but now because of an adjusted crew rotation for Crew 4 and Crew 5, Crew 4's mission will be shorter in duration, so Expedition 68 will now actually take place after Cristoforetti's departure from the station. By itself, this isn't the biggest piece of news, but I did want to bring it up early in case any headlines start coming out about this reshuffle being something to do with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This is completely separate, there's no correlation whatsoever, this is just a pure coincidence. Christopher Retti will still have the role of lead of the United States Orbital Segment, or USOS, which includes the US, European, Japanese and Canadian models and components, but she just won't be the commander of the ISS. Starlink dishes have been sent to Ukraine from SpaceX following a request from the Vice Prime Minister of the country, Mikhailo Fedorov, last week. This is in case Russia decides to cut off other lines of communications, as in some parts of Ukraine, the only active non-Russian communication system is Starlink, which makes it a big target. According to CEO Elon Musk, Starship and Starlink version 2 will suffer from slight delays due to a prioritization of cybersecurity and anti-jamming upgrades to the existing satellites and dishes. These come after some other software changes over the past few days, which have been able to reduce the terminal's power consumption, meaning that they can be powered by a cigarette lighter port in a car, and SpaceX has also enabled roaming, so Starlink can be used on moving vehicles. Something that some people won't be as happy to see, however, is the fact that Starlink is not blocking Russian news sources from its network unless it is held at gunpoint. Those are the words of Elon Musk, not me. There have been calls from several governments, but not Ukraine, to ban Russian media following in the footsteps of the likes of the EU who have blocked the broadcasters Russia Today and Sputnik from broadcasting in their territory. Ofcom, the communications regulator here in the UK, has also opened up 15 new investigations on Russia Today. As I went through on last week's news show, OneWeb is in a bit of a sticky situation and the initial steps of getting out of this sticky situation have been unfolding over the past week. On March 2nd, alongside a clip of an interview with Dmitry Rogozin, Roscosmos tweeted that they had warned OneWeb that they needed to confirm their network can't be used for military purposes by 21.30 Moscow Standard Time, and if they didn't, then their ride to space on March 5th would be removed from the pad. 
Then, an hour later, Rose Cosmos replied to that tweet after remembering that the UK government owns a stake in OneWeb, so they added another condition that the UK government needed to get rid of their shares for the launch to go ahead because of their quote-unquote hostile stance towards Russia. We then got this video from Rose Cosmos director Dmitry Rogozin of workers at the Baikonur Cosmodrome covering the flags of the United Kingdom, Japan, United States, South Korea and France. Alongside this video was the line, and I quote, the launchers at Baikonur decided that without the flags of some countries, our rocket would look more beautiful. Covering the flags on your fairing before the customer has even made a decision is probably the most petty thing that could be done, but after seeing Rogozin's countless Twitter rants over the last few days, I'm not even surprised to be honest, he banned Scott Kelly. The following day, March 3rd, some even less surprising news was officially confirmed by OneWeb that the board of OneWeb had voted to suspend all launches from Baikonur. This statement was followed up by Kwasi Kwarteng, the UK Secretary of State for Business, who said that the UK government supports OneWeb's decision and that the participation in further projects involving Russian collaboration are currently being reviewed. So there we have it. It took a little while, but we now have official confirmation that OneWeb will not be launching from Baikonur, which I'm assuming means that Soyuz launches aren't off the table for them from French Guiana, but as I said last week, Roscosmos isn't going to be supporting any Ariane Space Soyuz launches from Kourou. The situation with Northrop Grumman's Antares is not looking any better. Even if they can return to first stage construction in Ukraine, Roscosmos has stated that they are stopping deliveries of the RD-181, the engines, on the first stage. They also said that they will not service the remaining RD-180s in the US, which are used on the Atlas V, but as ULA are going to be moving to Vulcan pretty soon with Blue Origin's BE-4 engines, I don't believe that will be much of a problem. If you do want to learn more about the situation Northrop Grumman is in, then I went into a lot more detail in last week's episode, which you can check out in the card on your screen now. There have been a lot more tweets from both Rogozin and Rose Cosmos over the last week, but they're not exactly factual or appropriate, so we'll just move on to the next segment. February 10th, 2022 saw Astra launch again a 41 on Launch Vehicle 8 from the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. Everything went okay until, from what it looked like on the onboard cameras, the fairing decided not to separate, which sealed the fate for the four small sats on board. Immediately after the anomaly, Astra initiated their investigation process to determine the root cause of the problem, and the Senior Director for Mission Management and Assurance at Astra, Andrew Griggs, just published their report into what they have learned. We were correct in predicting that the payload fairing didn't deploy properly, and that was because of an electrical issue which was caused by an error in an electrical harness engineering drawing. The five separation mechanisms which are on the fairing were fired in the wrong order, which meant that the fairing moved in a way which wasn't expected, which caused an electrical disconnection. That disconnection then meant that the final separation mechanism couldn't separate because it never received the command to open. There was also a separate software issue, a packet loss failure mode, which was discovered in the second stage's flight control software, which meant that it was unable to use its thrust vector control system. That's the system which gimbals the engine and steers the vehicle. If the TVC system was working properly, then the second stage might have been able to recover from its spin. The electrical harness drawing has been fixed and previously built harnesses for future vehicles have also been adapted. Astra also introduced a new end-of-line signal test which will allow them to find these types of problems in the future before the rocket goes to the launch site to prevent this specific failure from happening again. Their flight software has been updated which will make it more resilient to packet loss as well. The next launch is currently scheduled for launch on March 13th but will get into space traffic after this next story. The Space Launch System, everybody's favourite big orange rocket, has just had its per launch operating cost shared with the world, and it's a bit more than the figures NASA was aspiring for a few years ago. NASA wanted it to cost $2 billion or less in 2016, but before a House Science Committee hearing on March 1st, NASA Inspector General Paul Martin said that the cost for just one launch of the entire stack, with Orion, the rocket itself, and the ground support systems would be $4.1 billion, US dollars, a number which they see as unsustainable. $2.2 billion will be going to the construction of a single SLS rocket, $1 billion is going to the Orion vehicle, $600 million is going to the ground support equipment, and $300 million is being sent back to Europe for ESA's Orion service module. That figure doesn't account for the development costs of each system either, or the costs of the Artemis program, which Paul Martin believes to be $93 billion spent between 2012 and 2025. NASA doesn't plan to launch more than one Artemis mission a year, but even if they did, Martin doesn't think that the costs could come down. A decades-long story short, SLS 
it's going to cost a lot of money, but we already knew that. It's just now there's an actual number that can be put into the headlines and YouTube thumbnails. No matter what, SLS is going to fly, not only because it's already cost a lot of money to develop, but because it needs to. Its reason for existence now is to start the Artemis program. If you want to make your comparison to Starship, you can go ahead. And Starship will cost less to operate according to SpaceX, but it is fundamentally a different vehicle for a different purpose. So in my opinion, it doesn't matter. SLS is going to fly, whether or not the SpaceX fanboys believe Starship is better. We had four launches in the past week, two of which SpaceX fanboys probably believe could have been flown on a Falcon 9, so let's take a look at some space traffic. First up is Goes T on this Atlas V in the 541 configuration, meaning it had a 5 meter fairing, 4 solid rocket motors, and 1 engine on the Centaur upper stage. Launching at 2138 UTC on March the 1st from Slick 41 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida, the payload for this mission is NOAA's fourth generation weather satellite. Once it reaches its final geostationary orbit, it will be renamed to Goes 18 and it will replace the faulty Goes 17 satellite. This was United Launch Alliance's second launch of 2022 for their 149th total mission. Following that launch, we had another from the Cape, specifically Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center. Launching at 1435 Coordinated Universal Time on March 3rd, Falcon 9 B1060 carried 13,900 kilograms of Starlink satellites to their initial 317 by 305 kilometer, 53.22 degree low Earth orbit for SpaceX's ninth launch of the year. Approximately just after 8 minutes into flight, B-1060 touched down on Just Read the Instructions for another record-matching 11th time, and the fairings were also recovered by support ship Bob for their 4th and 3rd flights respectively. Next up is a launch from China, Yin He-1, a launch of 6 satellites on Long March 2C from internet constellation Galaxy Space, a private Chinese competitor to Starlink and OneWeb. Launching at 0601 UTC on March 5th from Launch Complex 3 at the Xichang Satellite Launch Center, the launch is reported to be a success. The last launch to cover is this launch of the Quaze rocket from Iran, which launched on March 8th at 0900 UTC, carrying the NOR-2 satellite to an approximate altitude of 500 kilometers. Coming up over the next seven days, we have Starlink Group 410, Astra with S4 crossover, and Starlink Group 412. Tomorrow is a crowdfunded show and these are some of the wonderful people who have joined us. If you want to become a Tomorrow citizen, either in the Escape Velocity, Orbital, Suborbital, or Ground Support categories, then you can do so by clicking the Join button below and you get to experience some cool perks such as exclusive Discord channels, being able to see scripts as they're being written, and getting access to the live broadcasts before and after the actual Tomorrow live show. If that sounds like something you'd be interested in, click that Join button below or head to youtube.com forward slash tomorrow forward slash join. Fingers crossed, Tomorrow Live is back at the weekend this Friday in the US or very early Saturday morning in Europe. So if you want to come hang out with us for about an hour, then you can do so then. Make sure you have notifications on for that as well. But for now, thank you so much for watching. Hopefully we'll see you next week for the next episode of the news. Stay safe and goodbye.